Hello, Owls, and welcome to ACT English for Owls week number six. This week, we're going to continue working on some of our advanced punctuation skills. So last week, we learned about some commas and some uh, other punctuation marks, the period and such. But this week, we're going to tackle some other things. So let's remind ourselves first of some basic punctuation skills. We need to know how to use commas, semicolons, and apostrophes. Those are the three that are most assessed on the ACT. But we also want to know about hyphens, colons, dashes, and other things. And we'll tackle those today as well. We need to recognize the power of the period, and mostly because the period tells us that the uh, end of the sentence is here, and uh, it's time to just assess that sentence. And then finally, know how to repair punctuation issues. So those are the things assessed by the ACT. Remember, the punctuation is just a matter of road signs. If good punctuation uh, barely blends into the background and you sort of obey the rules as you go without it being uh, sort of in your face. So good punctuation and good writing involves guiding the reader uh, through the journey that is your sentence. So uh, we have already covered periods and commas. That's in week number five. Week number six here this week, we're gonna cover semicolons and apostrophes and hyphens and dashes and colons, oh my. So uh, you can uh, either watch this whole video or if you feel like you wanna dial in on one of those, just one of those, feel free to uh, scroll past uh, until you see some slides that uh, meet your needs. But we're gonna work on those lesser, uh, more advanced, uh, lesser used, more advanced like semicolons, hyphens and dashes and like that. So if you took the pretest, we're gonna be looking at questions uh, one through 72 that you see that column there. Those are the punctuation questions. We're not going to do so many ACT questions this week on those. We'll do some of those next week, I think. But uh, here are the punctuation questions from the pretest that specifically line up with the uh, punctuation questions. So let's dig in and start talking about semicolons. There are three ways to use a semicolon. We talked about them, one of them last week when we talked about using two independent clauses joined uh, for artistic impact. So if you've got two independent clauses, you can join them with a semicolon without using a conjunction. So we'll see some examples of that, but here's one example. I love baseball, semicolon, I hate football. Notice I don't have a conjunction. I don't say I love baseball, comma, and I hate football. I love baseball, comma, but I, love, I hate football. I just had that semicolon, which makes it more powerful. I love baseball, I hate football. And for you football fans out there, let me reverse it. I love football, semicolon, but I hate baseball. Whatever you want to do. I don't have an opinion. But uh, you can join those two independent clauses with a semicolon without using a conjunction. And that can make a more powerful sentence, right? That's what we mean by artistic impact. The second way to use a semicolon is to join two independent clauses linked by a strong transitional word. And again, we'll see some examples of that in some future slides. And we looked at it last week. I like baseball, semicolon, however, comma, it seems to go too slow for me or too fast for me. Again, I don't have an opinion. And then finally, to separate items in a series that contain commas, those are more complex and we'll need to look at some examples. But those are the three ways, three ways that we can uh, use a semicolon in our writing. So let's go back to that first way to join two independent clauses without a conjunction for artistic impact. I will not rest semicolon. I will fight on. Do you notice that just having this semicolon right here is awfully powerful? It really adds some oomph to the sentence when you don't weaken it with a coordinating conjunct like foreign, nor, but, or, yet, so. You just, I will not rest, I will fight on. You sense that that adds some, some mystery, some dynamicism, some oomph to that sentence when you just use the semicolon rather than weakening it with, I will not rest and I will fight on. Or, or how about this one? Some people write with a laptop, others write with a pen or pencil. Um, having that semicolon there adds a little bit more powerful, like meh, meh rather than, well, some people write with a laptop while others write with a pen or pencil. You can just use that semicolon and it adds a little bit of artistry to your writing. The cow is brown, semicolon, it is also old. Now, the one thing I want you to recognize is that the only way you can use a semicolon to connect two independent clauses is if they are in fact independent clauses. If you say, uh, I will not rest, I will fight on, these are both complete sentences. Some people write with a laptop is a complete sentence, Others write with a pencil is a complete sentence. The cow is brown is a complete sentence. It is also old is a complete sentence. If you're trying to connect two incomplete sentences or one complete sentence to an incomplete sentence, you cannot use a semicolon. A semicolon can only be used to connect two independent clauses, two complete sentences. The second way is to join two independent clauses by a strong transitional word. We sort of did this last week, so hopefully this is review, but you'll notice the pattern here goes semicolon, Strong transitional word like however, consequently, or therefore, comma, 
and then another independent clause. So independent clause, independent clause, independent clause, independent clause, independent clause, independent clause, and then semicolon, strong transitional word, comma, semicolon, strong transitional word, comma, semicolon, strong transitional word, comma. The pattern repeats. I like cows, semicolon, however, comma, I hate the way they smell. You're connecting two independent clauses linked by a strong transitional word. If you said, I like cows, but I hate the way they smell, that is not a strong transitional word. If it's one of the coordinating conjunctions, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so, or a word like that is too weak for a semicolon, that would simply be, I like cows, but I hate the way they smell. That would be just separated by a comma. I like cows, comma, but I hate the way they smell. But words like, however, consequently, therefore, you just sense that those are kind of more strong, uh, those are stronger, more powerful transitional words. So you would use a semicolon. All right, finally, we have to separate items in a series that contain commas. And this one, I want your eyes on the screen because we've got a lot going on in these examples. But what we've got are, most importantly, items in a series. But each item in the series contains commas. Now, if you say, uh, for dinner, I had salad, comma, steak, comma, and potatoes, those are items in a series, but there's no commas within those items. Let me show you what I mean. There are basically two ways to write. So we've got a series here. The first is with a pencil or uh, with a pen or pencil, which is inexpensive and easily accessible. The second is by a computer and a printer. The problem is, is that if I want to use commas, I'm already using commas to separate these extra phrases, which is expensive, inexpensive and easily accessible, which is more expensive, but quick and neat. So what's happening is I've got some longer uh, items in a series. And within each item, I am already using commas to separate out some information. So item A is a whole bunch of words that require some commas within that item. Item B is also a whole long item that requires some commas within that item. So I'm using semicolons to connect some items in a series that contain commas within them. Uh, number two is a good example. Some people write with a word processor, comma, tablet, comma, or even a phone, but others, comma, for different reasons, comma, chose to write with a pen or pen, pencil. What's happening is this comma and this comma and this comma and this comma make it impossible for me to connect two phrases with a comma. In other words, if you look at your screen, if I've got comma, 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 and then I start a uh, for item number one, let's say, and item number two in my series contains comma, 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 camellia, what I cannot do is connect these with a comma because then it just un runs together. What I have to do is connect them with a semicolon, which makes clear that I am separating one and two. One has some commas in it, two has some commas in it. I'll give you another example. I like cows for three reasons. One, they give us milk, comma, which tastes good. Then I've got a semicolon here. Two, they give us beef, comma, which also tastes good, semicolon. And three, they give us leather, comma, which is used for shoes and coats. So in other words, look at my cursor here uh, at the top where I've got this one and two, where my, you see my cursor moving in the screen. I like cows. They give us milk, comma, which tastes good. Then I've got the semicolon. They give us beef, comma, which also tastes good, semicolon, number three. And they give us leather, comma, which is used for shoes and coats. In other words, I need these two semicolons to do some heavy lifting because I'm separating some big chunky items in a series that contain commas. All right, hope that all made sense. Now let's look at some examples. I love sports, but I am also lazy. I love animals, but I am not vegetarian and I love teaching, but I hate talking, taking classes. Whew, that's a lot. Take a look at these uh, choices. Hit pause until you think you have an answer and hit unpause and I'll tell you what the answer is. The answer is number... Two, I love sports, comma, but I am also lazy. I love animals, comma, but I am not vegetarian. And I love teaching, comma, but I hate taking classes. I've got three items in a series. One, two, three. Each item has a comma, 
And to separate them, I need a semicolon between each one. So if you go back up to this sentence, I love sports, but I am also lazy, semicolon. I love animals, comma, but I'm not vegetarian, semicolon. And I love teaching, comma, but I hate taking classes. There you go. Next one, uh, he would never tell any of them this, comma, of course, peer or comma, they might get offended. So it's asking you in number six, really, what should this be? Of course, with no change, of course, with nothing, of course, with a colon, or of course, with a semicolon. Hit pause. The correct answer is four. You can use a semicolon right here because these are two independent clauses. He would, have, he would never tell any of them this, of course. That is a complete sentence. That's an independent clause. They might get offended is an independent clause. You can separate these two independent clauses with a semicolon. That's true even if there's other punctuation elsewhere in the independent clause. That would not interrupt it. And you're not using this as a transitional word, so you wouldn't need a semicolon then a comma. Uh, you're not separating them with, an, with a tr strong transition word. Okay, next, uh, the show is based upon these girls' lives, and it doesn't always seem to have to do with their children as it has to do with them being teenagers. So don't worry about the first part, but start with their children. It has to do with them being teenagers. Hmm. Which one best improves the sentence? Doesn't always have to seem to do with their children. It has to do with them being teenagers, separated by a semicolon. Their children, it has to do with them comma, being teenagers, or their children, comma, it has to do with them being teenagers. What do we want to do with their children? It's asking you, what do you want to do right there? Hit pause, figure it out. The correct answer is one. It doesn't always have to, oh, it doesn't always seem to have to do with their children is an independent clause. It has to do with them being teenagers is an independent clause. And I would use a semicolon to separate these. All right, let's talk about apostrophes. The first rule on the ACT is you have to know the difference between it's versus it's. However you can solidify in your mind, just forever know, I don't even know a, a fancy little mnemonic or memorable phrase that I can say. I've never learned a way to sort of, uh, you know, I before E, F, except after C. There's nothing like that I've ever learned. Please send me an email. Let me know if you've ever heard of anything uh, that works for you, but Every time I use it's versus it's with a comma or apostrophe, I always have to slow down and just figure it out. It's is possessive. It's with an apostrophe is a contraction. So take a look down here. It's is the possession. It's the possessive form of it. The dog wag its tail. No apostrophe. If it's a contraction, as in it is, as in I think it's going to rain today, then you would need an apostrophe. The problem with this, and the reason why it's tough, is that if you have a word like can't, we have learned that cannot can be, can be shortened with a contraction. And that's what we're doing down here with it's with a contraction. But it's without the apostrophe is possession. But the challenge is, if you want to say it's Bob's car, you're going to use this apostrophe. So apostrophe can you use for contraction, but it can also be used for possession. And the problem is that apostrophe is doing some heavy lifting. Sometimes it's used to combine two words and leave out some letters, as in IT apostrophe S. And other times it's used for possession, as in Bob's car, to show ownership. But it's is going to be the exception to our possession rule. I-T-S with no apostrophe is going to be a possession. Uh, the dog wagged its tail. So I, we, I want you to know that whenever you're taking the ACT and you see the word it's or it is or it's, whenever you see a question with that, I need you to slow down and just parse it out and just say, I've got to remember, I-T-S without the apostrophe is possession. I-T apostrophe S is a contraction. And again, I don't have an easy way for you to remember that, but you've got to be able to uh, slow down and say, I do know the difference. I just need to figure it out. Okay. You can also use an apostrophe to add uh, S to a singular noun. So ownership, just sort of like this last slide, Bob apostrophe S car. 
An apostrophe can just show ownership. Dimitri's dreams, the cat's favorite window, the earth's curvature, my mother's phone call, the podcast listener. In other words, the dreams belong to Dimitri. The windowsill belongs to the cat. The curvature belongs to the earth. The phone calls belong to the mother. And listeners own, uh, um, uh, belongs to the podcast. The podcast owns the listeners. The mother owns the phone calls. The earth owns the curvature. The cat owns the windowsill. Dimitri owns the dream. So you're showing possession. You're showing ownership. Apostrophe S is how you show that something is owned by something or that something owns something else. And then apostrophe rule number three is add a single apostrophe to the end of the plural nouns ending in S. This is fairly easy. If you've got multiple books, it's S apostrophe. So if you said the books cover, you're talking about one book. If you said the books covers, and this is plural, you're talking about multiple books. So you just move the, rather than apostrophe S, you just do S apostrophe. And that's how you show that there are multiple books um, involved in this. All right, same with sidewalks, cracks, my teacher's curriculum. How about this one? My teacher's curriculum means all of your teachers, not just your science, math, or English, or, or uh, PE teacher, right? So uh, there you go. Okay, uh, let's try this. Some relate to me, to the events of the past ages, while others reveal to me the secrets of nature. Is it past ages, comma, since? In other words, uh, you're just changing the word since. Past ages uh, with an apostrophe S, and then while. Past ages with an apostrophe S, semicolon, while, or no change. Hit pause and figure it out. The answer is no change. This is perfectly fine. Ages is not possessive of anything. It's not a contraction. Uh, past ages is perfectly fine. You would need uh, a semicolon, or I'm sorry, a comma here. Um, there is the option for the semicolon, but this would ruin it. Like you could put a semicolon here uh, while others reveal to me the secrets of nature. You could argue it's an independent clause. It's not really, but I don't want to have that fight right now. But if you want to say, look, it's connecting to independent clauses, that's fine. Use a semicolon. The problem is, is that they're wanting to sneak in this apostrophe, and that does ruin it. So your only option that uh, would work is past ages, comma, while others reveal to me the secrets of nature. Okay, next one. There are several ways to use contractions correctly. That's actually the sentence. So take a look at all of your options. Hit pause and see which one is correct. The answer is four, none of them correct. There are several ways to use contractions correctly. That's not even a word. They are, meaning they are, no, they would be a pronoun referring to people. Uh, they aren't doing anything uh, correctly in this sentence. There's, there is several ways, no subject verb agreement. Um, there are, that's again, there being the possessive pronoun, uh, no. So none of the versions here are listed correctly. Hope you got that one right. All right, choose the grammatically correct version of the following sentence. Lisa and me went to a party and celebrated Stacy's birthday. If your little spidey sense didn't tingle when you heard Lisa and me, maybe it should because that is a common mistake. Take a look, hit pause, see if you can figure it out. The answer is number one. Lisa and I went to a party and celebrated Stacy's with a possession because the birthday belongs to Stacy, right? So uh, by the way, let's have two conversations. Let's deal with the apostrophe first because that's what we're studying today. Stacy apostrophe S, it is her birthday. She owns it. And uh, so that's possession. So we'd use an apostrophe right here. But let's also deal with this nonsense over here because it tends to be a problem. Lisa and I went to a party. If you've ever had a parent or teacher say, when you say Lisa and me went to a party, or yesterday, me and Lisa, or uh, the, the, the me is a problem, right? And here's how you can tell. If you want a great way to remember it, cross out some words. Cross out this. Would you say me went to a party and celebrated Stacy's birthday? No, you would not. You're not a person of the cave. Or how about this? Yesterday, me went to a party and celebrated Stacy's birthday. You would not say that. You would say, I went to a party and I went to a party. So uh, I literally, you just, me rarely belongs at the beginning of the sentence unless you're using it in the objective sense. And boy, that's another lesson altogether. So let's keep moving on. Let's talk about colons. All right, a colon is a powerful punctuation mark. It's also a body part, but this is not anatomy. There are dozens of ways to use a colon, but we will focus on two ways. The first way is colons introduce lists. 
And the second way is that colons can separate into, uh, related independent clauses. We'll show you what you mean here by talking about colons introducing lists. Colons can introduce lists and what they're doing is they're silently functioning as a way of saying, and here they are. Let's look at our examples. We covered many of the fundamentals in our writing class and here they are, grammar, punctuation, style, and voice. My roommate gave me the things I needed most and here they are, companionship and quiet. Many graduating students discover that there is a dark side to academia, and here they are. Late nights, high stress, crippling addiction to caffeinated beverages. Now, here's what I want you to notice. I've got commas involved here, here, and here. And down here, I've got commas involved here, here, and that's it. But And, and here, I don't have commas. But I want you to notice what happens. Let's say that I change this colon to a comma, just a comma. We covered many of the fundamentals in our writing class, grammar, punctuation, style, and voice. What happens is when you change this to a comma, writing class and grammar have the same weight because the reader thinks you're creating a list. We covered many of the fundamentals in our three, four things. One, our writing class, two, our grammar, three, our punctuation, four, our style, and five, our voice. But that's not what you're trying to say. Writing class is what is covered uh, or what covers all these things. So writing class includes grammar, punctuation, style, and voice. So the colon separates this list. How about this? My roommate gave me, gave me two things. My roommate gave me companionship. My roommate gave me quiet. Okay. This colon says, I'm about to give you a list. The colon says, I'm about to give you a list. Okay, try it down here. My graduating student, my graduate student discovers there's a dark side to academia. And now I'm going to give you a list of those things. They include late nights, high stress, and crippling addiction, caffeinated beverages. So your colons can introduce lists and silently function is basically saying here they are. The second way to use colons is to join independent clauses like uh, just like semicolons. And there's generally a shift in tone. And that shift in tone is really important. You cannot just start slapping colons all over your paper and expect to, the reader to be following you because colons imply, hey, this sentence is taking a slight left turn or slight right turn, and it's going in a different direction. So look at number one, life is like a puzzle, colon, half the fun is trying to work it out. In other words, you're, th this is sort of like, here is my claim and here is my evidence, okay? Here is my claim, the research is conclusive, and here is my evidence. Climate change is a reality. I know two things for sure, and there's a change, a shift in tone. I'm happy and free. You'll notice that when you use this comma to divide these two sentences, you really are sort of dividing it because you need something more powerful than a comma. Take a look. If I use commas for this, look what happens. Life is like a puzzle, comma, half the fun is trying to work it out. There is enough of a shift in tone that you need something more powerful than a comma. Or how about this? The research is conclusive, comma, climate change is a reality. Those aren't necessarily, they don't go together as smoothly with a comma, and there's an awkward shift in change uh, in tone. So that shift probably requires some pretty advanced punctuation. Let me show you what it looks like without them. The uh, three types of music, uh, sorry, muscle, the three types of muscle in the body are, and then, yeah, you're presenting a list, but the problem is, is that you are just, let me show you. Um, let's say you said the three types in the muscle in the body are all great. Well, then you might need a comma because all great sort of makes that a complete sentence. But notice this is not a complete sentence. It's not an independent clause. And if you don't have an independent clause, you really don't need a colon. Independent clause, independent clause, independent clause, not an independent clause. So all you need is just a comma. Or, or, and here, just this comma and this comma, you do not need a colon. The three types of muscle in the body are cardiac, smooth, and skeletal. Just these two commas will do. Same thing here. When I graduate, I wanna to go to is not a complete sentence. I'm sure you wanna to go to these places, but leave the colon out. These commas are fine for separating your list. Okay. Last thing, hyphen and dash. The hyphen connects words such as, watch my screen, self-starter, willpower, and first rate. A dash connects clauses. So if you're connecting words like self-starter, 
willpower, and first rate, you are using a hyphen. If you're connecting clauses, you're using a dash. Here's 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 a dash. And here's a dash. Notice that these are all connecting clauses while the hyphen connects words. You will also want to say that a clause is typically, and, and, and here's where we make a little bit of exception, like Ireland is not necessarily a clause. What we're using the, di the dash to set apart important ideas in a longer sense. After 80 years of dreaming, the elderly man realized it was timely find, finally time to revisit the land of his youth, dash Ireland or the office dash a harmless television program. So it's not that these are connecting two clauses in this first example, they're not. They're, they're, they're connecting important ideas, all right? Or now you have, uh, you know, dash can emphasize a modifier. Everything I saw in my neighborhood, you could also use parentheses here, from the graceful elm trees to the stately brick buildings, you can either close the parentheses or use two dashes to separate them, reminding me of my alma mater, because if we talk about meat and potatoes, the true sentence is, everything I saw reminded me of my alma mater. Everything else is just extra words, but we want them there because that's good writing, right? So um, we use uh, parentheses or we use dashes to set up product clauses. Let's look at that again. Uh, the second example, the students, dash, they were each over the age of 18, dash, lined up in the streets to vote for the presidential candidates. So in other words, the students lined up in the streets. But if you wanna add more information, the students, and hold on, I need to tell you more, they were all over the age of 18. Let's go back to our sentence, lined up in the streets, right? Or how about this? Even the simplest of tasks, and now I'll tell you what they are, washing, dressing, and going to work, back to our sentence, were nearly impossible after I broke my leg, all right? So you can use dashes to connect uh, either major ideas but uh, or clauses and things like that. But generally speaking, a dash stops the reader, redirects, and then brings the reader back into the sentence. So dashes are pretty powerful. Um, they're more stream of consciousness than semicolons and colons. And they typically, you can hear a dash, you can hear a, a reader or an author stopping and sort of making a side note, almost like you would with parentheses, right? So parentheses and dashes kind of say, look, I'm gonna stop the mid thought and sort of sneak in another thought. And then I'm gonna go back to my regularly scheduled sentence. All right, folks, that's it. We're going to get ready for week number seven. Take a look at any punctuation questions you did on the pretest. Download that link, uh, download the pretest, and see if you can spot some uh, punctuation questions. And I will see you next week. Bye bye.